Hello there, my name's Jo Durrant, presenter of Jo Durrant's Beautiful Universe. I love celebrating arts and science, particularly as part of our culture. So it's a pleasure to be hosting this panel today. Uh, it's part of the Dr. Jenner's House Museum and Garden Discovery Day. It is Science Communication 101. I have a great panel for you, so let's meet them, shall we? Uh, first up, Adam Hart, Professor Adam Hart, scientist, author, broadcaster. Um, I'm sure you'll have seen him in various TV documentaries like Hive Alive, Live and uh, Life on Planet Ant. Uh, you'll have also heard him on various uh, BBC documentaries for BBC World Service and Radio 4. And he's recently published his latest book, Unfit for Purpose, which looks at the mismatches between human beings and the modern world. He's also written more than 80 scientific papers and he's Professor of Science Communication at the University of Gloucestershire. Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, next up, we have Professor Jo Verren. Uh, Joanna Verren is Emeritus Professor of Microbiology at Manchester Metropolitan University. So in addition to her laboratory-based research career, which investigated the interactions between microorganisms and inert surfaces, uh, Jo's also won awards for her innovative approaches to teaching and public engagement. Uh, jo is particularly interested in using the arts to assist with science communication, and she set up the Bad Bugs Book Club in 2009. So this is where scientists and non-scientists discuss works of fiction in which infectious disease forms part of the plot. So welcome to Joe. Hello. And our final panellist today is Rebecca Ellis. Now, Rebecca is a PhD student at the University of Swansea. She's studying the improvement of care pathways for autistic children in Wales. She studied psychology with cognitive neuroscience at Nottingham University. She went on to do a master's in person-centred counselling, and she recently won the UK final of the science communication competition, FameLab. That went on to a digital platform this year for obvious reasons. And she's going to be competing, representing the UK in the international finals in November. Now she performed her presentation as poems uh, with a new poem at each, st each stage of the competition and her winning performance was a three minute poem on autism's fake news. And uh, among the things that she likes are large jumpers, board games, the autumn, it's a good time of year to be doing this, and large mugs that hold just enough tea and long walks on the beach. So welcome to Rebecca. Hi Jo, hi everyone. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to delve into the world of science communication through this panel. Um, just briefly, I mean, I've, I've given you all a bit of a, a, a good introduction, so we know who you are and what you do, but how did you all come to be at the point you're at now? How did you all kind of enter into the world of science communication? Should I start with you first of all, Adam, because you are Professor of Science Communication. Um, well, I, I kind of got into it a little bit by accident. When I was doing my PhD, um, I shared a lab with a, a French guy who was doing a postdoc and he'd done some really interesting work on very large ants um, that had this kind of weird mafia dynamic going on where they were all kind of beating each other up. It was very surprising for ants for, for a lot of people and the press really took to it and they were the ant hill mob obviously and all this kind of stuff and he didn't feel very confident about talking um, live about it so he asked if I'd do some of those interviews. So I started doing some um, and I was on BBC Radio Three Counties which is one of your uh, one of your sort of uh, sister local radio kind of um, places. And, and I was only supposed to be on for about five minutes talking about ants, but we started talking about other bugs. And, and in the end, I think I was on for about an hour and a half across the news and all kinds of stuff. And, and they said, will you come back every month and do a bug slot? So I said, yeah, that would be brilliant. So that, that was kind of the first thing that I did. Um, and it just sort of grew from there really. And I was carried on doing, you know, my, my main job is not science communication actually, it's actually, you know, teaching and research. Um, but the science communication strands always been very, very important. and, and um, when I when I got offered a chair, then I was able to call myself what I wanted, and at the time that that seemed to make make as much sense as any, because it sort of foregrounds that side of what I do and makes that because I, I think that's something that we all struggle with a little bit as um, as scientists sometimes is is making everyone realise just how important that part of our role is. So that was really my kind of my journey really to uh, to where we are now. Joe, what about you? Uh, well, uh, I came to it a bit later in my career, actually, because I'd always done lots of teaching and I tried to encourage my undergraduate students to think about how they communicated their microbiology. So I would get them to uh, make videos or make little leaflets about different microorganisms. And then I started to get them to create art to help them to communicate aspects of microbiology. And then I started thinking about um, using fiction and literature as ways of exploring microbiology. And I think that kind of led into, uh, oh, well, I'm talking to students and I'm getting students to talk to um, other, 
other people, other audiences, uh, uh, perhaps I should do it as well, actually, or, or probably actually I already was. So then I, I kind of started doing more specific events around um, science communication and public engagement. And I've always tried to bring other disciplines into to the work that I do and collaborate with lots of other different disciplines. So it's been, it's been really fun. And I think, uh, like with Adam, I ended up doing a lot of science communication al alongside my microbiology. And uh, I think science communication in, in the science curriculum, as well as beyond it at universities, is, is increasingly important nowadays as well. Well, we're definitely going to come back to talk about that multidisciplinary approach and definitely bringing arts into science. Um, Rebecca, tell us about your journey into science communication. Um, well, kind of fell into it like, like Adam, pretty much. I liked drama and I liked performing when I was at school. And then the idea of performing, but it being scientific, made me very anxious. I just preferred to make stuff up on the spot, just improvise anything. But when it came to performing science communication such as for a presentation at university i was always quite nervous about it but then last year as we as you already mentioned at the beginning of the academic year there was this advertisement for fame lab the science communication competition and you only had three minutes to talk about something and i thought that's a bit more control uh, i can't really mess up that badly within three minutes was my initial thought so I went for that and that's how I got into science communication. And especially now, we need to communicate more and more being in lockdown. I don't feel like I've communicated with near enough people. So that really drove me to talk more, publish more work, be more creative in how I spread the word about my research and think about it in a completely different light. So very new, very new beginnings to the science communication journey. Well, this question's for all of you. I mean, how important is good science communication? I'll stay with you on this one, Rebecca, for a moment. Well, like I said, during lockdown, let's talk about Corona and all the fake news that has been spreading about that. We have multiple sources of information to us across several social media platforms. And I think we need to be able to recognize what is good science and what isn't because we're getting a load of information given to us, for example, about Corona, and we don't know what's correct and what's not. And that really impacts both on your physical health, but also on your mental health, the stress of not knowing what's going on and, and what to do and whether a mask is safe or whether it isn't. I think science communication has been shown to be very important, especially over these last few months. We're going to come on and talk about myths a bit later on, do some myth busting. Um, Adam, I mean, same question, really. You know, science communication, it feels like it's never been more important than at this time. Yes, and, and not just the sort of the facts, if you like, but also the kind of mechanisms by which we get to them. You know, more and more people are starting to ask why. It's the most common question I get asked is, you know, how, well, apart from what's the point of WASPs, is, is how do you actually know that? People want to engage, I think, much more with the process of science, but we're not necessarily giving them that, that opportunity. But I think what's really interesting, I mean, we look back to those early briefings, even, even actually recently, we're seeing graphs up on, up on the screen. We're seeing actually logarithmic graphs, which aren't being explained properly, but they're up there. We're, we're seeing people talk about trends. We're seeing lines being fitted and moving averages and things on you know five o'clock in the afternoon. And, and I don't think I've ever seen that form of, of statistical presentation on, on the television before, certainly not as part of our everyday lives. Um, I, I teach a, a module looking at mathematical modeling and modeling in, in sort of um, ecology and stuff. And, you know, like I said to the students yesterday, we're living in a model, you know, more than anything now. We're starting to understand how these sorts of processes affect us. And I think that's a big challenge with science communication now because suddenly people are kind of seeing behind the curtain and seeing all these sort of mechanisms going on but but i don't think we're necessarily really getting the message across about how they all work and and i, I think that's a, a big challenge for the for the upcoming few years as well as people start to get more and more skeptical and cynical about about what's happening around us which which is inevitable i think and joe i think something you were saying to me was that we've got a whole new vocabulary now haven't we that we've all had to kind of get used to Yes, that's right. So uh, again, picking up from what Adam was talking about, the press briefings, and also what Rebecca was saying about how do you sort of select the, select the information. There, there's so much assimilation that an interested person um, needs to kind of sift through. And uh, yeah, the language itself is, you know, what about 
social distancing, even something as we never even heard of that right at the beginning, um, our values, uh, th there are so many different kinds of uh, new, new languages and also, um, as, as uh, Adam said, the statistics. And I think also it's been interesting to see how, uh, I suppose, being led by the science it is, has been used and perhaps misused as well, because the decisions that have to be made uh, rely on politicians as well, and they have to look at lots of other things. So it's not just sort of presenting the information, understanding the information, getting the right information. It's then, you know, what are you going to do then? Who is it you're listening to who's saying these things? So there is so much about science communication at the moment that is absolutely uh, critical. And uh, I, we should be coming into our own now, really, I suppose. Well, there is the thing, isn't there? The science. That's what we've heard quite a lot. And actually, is that a particularly helpful phrase, actually saying the science? Because you know, who's science? What science? Uh, yes, exactly. And I think um, to, to have sort of science on one side and, and whatever. Uh, and there are, there, are, there are many different scientists. There are many different types of scientists. Um, so you have sort of epidemiologists, public health scientists, virologists, microbiologists, and they all have knowledge and experience about coronavirus but um they may not be better able to talk about one other aspect and, and, I, and i think that's another very important point in science communication that you should be confident um about what you say and should be able to sort of defend what you say and be honest uh, and not kind of over over egg your own expertise because i think you know that uh, that also can be dangerous and uh so, you know, so we all need to be very careful and honest and clear about what we're saying and also to what audience we're saying it um, and, you know, who we're representing. So, yeah, it's a very, very complicated area. So we've talked about how important good science communication is. Maybe let's talk about some examples of not so good science communication, some bad science communication. Adam, can you start us off? Um, yeah, I guess um, for me, what, what I see quite a lot, so sort of taking it away from, from Corona, and we could, we could, of course, talk about, about that for the rest, of the rest of the panel, because there's so many good examples of, of, of what we're talking about in there. But, but in, in, in my field, for instance, in sort of um, conservation and ecology, I see quite a lot of what I would describe as sort of halfway house communication. So there's lots of amazing programs on the television, for example, about wildlife. But when you watch them, you actually don't get very much information about about wildlife. What it really is, is a sort of coffee table book brought to life. It's a fantastic thing to watch. But I think a lot of people think that, that in a way that's conveying really useful information. And actually, it very rarely is. And, and you know, it's very rarely conveying any useful information about, about the state of the planet. You know, we saw um, Atomer's recent uh, program about extinction. Yeah, it's the first time really that's been addressed properly in the media. And even then, actually, there were an awful lot of complaints from within um, conservation scientists about, about the way some of that was handled as well. But at least it's the start. So I think, I think within sort of wildlife and ecology and environmental issues, we're, we're still seeing a tendency towards the kind of fluffy animal side of things. Um, certainly, you know, I work a lot with invertebrates and, and they never really feature. Um, you're lucky if you can get anything on the television about anything or even on the radio actually, and even in the press about anything, uh, six or eight legged, that's not basically they're all coming to kill us and they're dreadful. You know, we're in the middle of spider season at the moment. You know, the best we can hope for is a sentence at the end that says, you know, actually spiders are really important ecologically and we should respect them. <laughs> the rest of it's all like, oh. Um, and, and that, that I think, is, is something that despite, despite the state we're on in the world, right, despite the sort of position we're at, we, we've known about these things for years. We are still yet to cross that threshold into a, a more mature um, discussion about the natural world, I think. So, so that would be my example of, of generally quite poor communication, I think. Well, we've also spoken before, Adam, when we've done myth busting about how, you know, obviously in the media you'll get a headline. So there was a thing about the insect apocalypse. Is that, am I re rem remembering that right? A year or so ago? Yeah, I mean, that was the front page of The Guardian um, back in, I think, uh, February 2019, wasn't it? And, you know, that was, that was um, a slight misinterpretation of a paper that uh, had a lot of overreach in it. Uh, it certainly started a very important conversation and now lots of people have been bringing forward um, articles and all sorts of other things and, and reports and, and collaborating with data sets and things. But, but yes, the insect apocalypse, that actually said that um, in, insects, not, not just an insect or a species or a group of insects, insects would be extinct um, within a hundred years, which, which is obviously laughable um, as, as a claim. I mean, it was never a claim that was made in the paper, but, but what they looked at was the decline in insect 
uh, abundance in one particular place, which was 4% a year, I think. And then they extrapolated that through and worked out, well, if it keeps declining at that rate, there's gonna be no insects left. Um, but that's not how extinctions work. And that's not how insect population dynamics work. But, and, and they got slammed for it um, quite considerably. I actually started almost a cottage industry of people writing papers and reports and articles about all of this sort of stuff, um, me included. But, but what that did at least was focus people on the fact, well, insects are actually very important and they are declining but we don't see that in the headlines now. You know, that's the thing, we are like plastics in the sea, everyone's, oh, it's terrible, you know, we've, made it, we've moved on to something else. Um, you know, that's, that last week, oh, extinctions, this week, yeah, oh, never mind, we'll find, we'll, you know, we'll find something else. It's getting that traction, I think, and getting people to really assimilate it that we, we struggle with in science communication. It's still kind of, a little flag comes up and then it disappears again. Um, Rebecca, what about you? What examples have you, have you found of not very good science communication? I think in terms of when I'm on Twitter, I usually see someone's opinion masquerading as science. Someone says this is a fact where actually if you look at it a bit further, it's their opinion on some information that they've read or that they found. And often that leads to misinterpretation. It's like when people say that um, sharks kill more people in the summer. And, uh, you know, it must, and then people start thinking, well, it must be something that sharks, I don't know, they, they get the feel the warm weather on their back and they go, ah, time to kill. Um, <laughs> whereas it's actually, if you think about it, fewer people are swimming in the sea in the autumn and in the winter. So that would make sense. And sharks come inland maybe more in the summer months. So it's about taking information and then misinterpreting it. And I think we've got to add a level of clarity to the words that we use in order to stop that from happening. But obviously when you have something like a tweet or a Facebook post, you've only got a certain amount of space to take what you've heard and summarize it. And sometimes we make that emotive to get people's, you know, eyes on it a bit more. And, and that's where we find a bit of a miscommunication. And um, Joe, and same question to you. I know something you were saying to me was that, um, you, you said it just now, almost everybody kind of thinks they're an expert now, don't they? We see lots of people that have got, you know, as Rebecca says, an opinion that's sort of masquerading as, as giving us facts. Yes. And I, I think that's, um, it's a real shame because I think some people who perhaps are celebrities who have a voice that other people listen to on social media for, for whatever reason, it would be very wonderful if they, they had, um, the responsibility or the or the consideration that uh, what they say is important to a lot of people and therefore be good to check whether it, it's correct or whether it's as you, as you say just an opinion so I, I think um, yes that's very important as, as to who is saying these things uh, as Rebecca was indicating I mean the, the I'm sorry to go back to microbiology again but of course that's what <laughs> but um, the way that people describe germs and bacteria and viruses and, and antibiotics and, and, and again even the terminology within microbiology it's quite easy to make um, those facts correct at least you know the difference between the virus and the bacterium and, and sometimes even that's kind of uh, sort of overlooked and the diagrams you see are not necessarily particularly accurate. I mean I, I just yest yesterday on the um, on the bulletin there was a list of all of the different vaccines that were available and one of the vaccines was called adenovirus and, and um, it was just a list of technical types of vaccines and I think you know possibly either not having those lists or explaining what what it actually meant or you know a bit, a bit more information about you know the nature of the different vaccines might have been interesting or perhaps not have been there at all and just to say that there were certain vaccines. So it, it, it's kind of selecting the information um, that's correct for the audience that you're passing it on to. It's important. Well, we're definitely going to talk about vaccines, I'm sure, before the end of the panel. Um, Adam, let me just come back to you a moment, because, so you know, Joe and Rebecca both talking about there, maybe people on Twitter and, you know, having a big following and having a voice. Is that something that you've come across? I'm thinking particularly in the work that you've done with, with conservation. We see lots of different voices, don't we, on, on this subject? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of, one of the areas that I'm involved with is, is the trophy hunting debate, um, which is far more complex and nuanced than, than press would have us believe. Um, you know, 
the, the press, the, the media basically presents trophy hunting as a terrible thing. And the reality is, um, whilst you might morally disagree with it, it, it protects currently about one and a half million square miles of habitat. And if it was banned tomorrow, um, we would see a wildlife disaster across most of southern and eastern Africa. Um, that's, that's not something that plays out very well, because to get to that point, you know, it's taken me about 20 years of quite intense study and more than 20 trips to those areas, speaking to all manner of people to actually develop, you know, an understanding of it. But of course, what we see on, on social media, an awful lot of, um, an awful lot of celebrities, a very easy thing to, to hook onto. Um, there was an article at the weekend talking about the evils of trophy hunting, which was, um, their only citation was Judy Dench. Now, Judy Dench is a wonderful actress. But she's not an expert on conservation in Africa. That's that's that, that's a simple fact. That's not a judgmental fact. It is a simple fact. And you know, there's the same sort of thing. And you'll see quite a lot of people wading into this. You know, Liam Gallagher was was squaring up on Twitter to a bunch of conservation scientists. Um, you know, it's kind of it's a little embarrassing actually sometimes when you read some of these things because you realise that that behind the bluster there really is no knowledge other than the fact that that they feel very strongly about it. Feeling very strongly about something is not the same as, as having much information or knowledge about it. And I think that's something that can get confused in social media. And we all, you know, we all get confused. It's not like we stand on sort of ivory towers looking down. We all fall into this trap at some point, right? We, we all, we all fall into this trap, but, but when, when you're, when you are informed about a particular subject and you see this going on, it is, it is very frustrating because of course, you know, as scientists, we, we have fairly small voices compared to, to things that go on. I can remember we did a citizen science campaign once on spiders and we were all just so pleased. We, we got all this media coverage and we got like 10,000 downloads and it was incredible. The front page of the Daily Star, for instance, <laughs> amazing, right? We thought this is great. And it was, it was about the time that um, uh, Katie Hopkins had made some comment on one of the morning programs about calling children after um, wine, right? And that had 45 million hits before <laughs> before I'd even managed to get out of bed. And so you, you realise the scale of the problem, right? However good we think we do in terms of reach, that reach is, is a drop in the ocean compared to what, what you know, big names and, and big organisations can get in a matter of hours or minutes actually, in some cases. So I think, I think that is another problem as well. We are sometimes feel a little bit like we're shouting in a hurricane, but that is uh, all we can do is keep shouting, I guess. Well, stay there, Adam. Well, not, not that you're going anywhere, because <laughs> we're in our living yeah. rooms. <laughs> That's yeah. a kind of a, a turn of phrase I'm very used to saying. Um, how much of a challenge, then, is it to communicate often complex research to a wider audience and to the media? It's very difficult. It's difficult for a number of reasons. First, and I think we all have to appreciate this, science is really hard. Like, some of this stuff is really difficult. You know, I can remember having, uh, it was a, one of the world's top engineers was explaining to me how an LCD television works. And it took him about half an hour and I was following every single step and we got to the end and there was this moment where I just looked at him and I thought, nope, <laughs> I've got nothing. Okay. Right? I, I followed him all the way along. It, was, it would have taken me, you know, days and days and days to even get to the point where I was scratching the surface. It's difficult. And that's partly down to terminology. You know, like Joe was saying, that the terminology and words and vocabulary are difficult. Some of the concepts are very difficult. It, it can be just very, very hard to get that across. And the other thing that, that I was told when I started doing broadcasting, one of the producers at, at Radio 4 said that you've got a kind of three-step problem, right? If you can take someone to where you want to get them you know on three stepping stones they'll probably come with you but if there's another step it's taken too long to explain and you've often lost those those people and, and I think the problem is some of the problems that we're dealing with in science they're five or six or ten or twenty step problems and and that's a big challenge how do we how do we get people to where we want them to be without sort of make, making them to a three-year degree program and you know a three-year post you know, postgraduate sort of uh, education as well. You know, that, that is a challenge because some of these things are, they're tricky, they're difficult concepts. Well, Rebecca, I think something you said to me is that you know, when you've done your research or you're communicating something, you know, write it down and have a look and think, could this be misinterpreted? Yes, it's about finding the delicate balance between getting all the complex information that you want to get across to people but also balancing that with how much time you have, how much, you know, they're willing to listen to you and put into it. I think you need to start by getting your key message and say, and writing it down and writing it maybe as short as you can between one or two sentences. And then you start with, could this be interpreted in a different way? Because we've got maybe some of the knowledge that we need to understand these theories and these ideas, but another person might not, and they might look at it from a completely different perspective, in which case we've got to look at it and we've got to say, could this be taken any other way? And I think that's where you have to start from. 
because the amount of misinterpretation and the damage that can be done from misinterpretation is huge. Well, let's talk about breaking down some of those barriers then to science communication. Um, Joe, you gave some really you know, good examples here. Things like understanding who the audience is is a, is a kind of an obvious thing to start with, isn't it? Yes, I think that's uh, probably where you would begin. If you know what you're doing and who you're doing it with, um, that's something to begin with. Is it adults, family, children, young people, or a, a specific type of public? Um, and then... Um, as Rebecca has said, what, what are your messages? What are your key messages? And I think, you know, used to do lots of things about having interview techniques. If you've got more than three points to make, then um, it's difficult. So have sort of a few simple messages. And then I do think being enthusiastic is important and, and being engaging, engaging, but also not being patronizing and also trying to um, have some sort of have some sort of level platform at somewhere where you and your audience can come together so that everyone is bringing something so that you're not just telling them loads of stuff that they they are they are bringing something as well and so some of the um events that that i've been involved with that's what that's what we try and do so that there is a lot of interaction going on rather than just some sort of didactic um activity so it's almost like an experiment you know what are your aims what is your methods you know how you're going to deliver your aims what results did you get and what you know what does it mean um so uh, planning i think is is important yeah. um, Re rebecca something you were saying to me quite a simple thing here you be a person be a be a human being and that you know it seems <laughs> yeah. simple doesn't it but actually that is so important yeah. Find that, find that connection, as Joe was saying, find that personal connection between you and another person and you can get across your point in a much better way and they'll be more open to receiving communication and it'll feel better and you'll feel enthusiastic and you'll feel optimistic about it. And that's the reason we got into this is, to, is because we enjoy doing it and we think it's important. I think one of the big problems we have is we think of scientists as as Adam said, up on that, you know, a pedestal, you know, maybe they know things that we don't. And it kind of creates a divide between scientists and academia and the public and everyone else. And there shouldn't be that divide. If anything, we should be closing up that divide to make science more accessible. Yeah, I mean, Rebecca, it's, I think you also said to me that you know the image we have of a scientist we keep having the person in the lab in the white lab coat you know that just gets perpetuated doesn't it and that's obviously not all that science is about no uh, like joe said there are so many different types of scientists out there and so many different types of researchers and i still got imposter syndrome for a long time thinking that i wasn't a scientist because i don't work in a lab and i don't use a lot of you, uh, software on computers and I really had to fight with myself to say well you're doing a PhD in human and health science so if you're not a scientist what are you at this point <laughs> and I, had, I really had to think about that I think we all get a little bit of imposter syndrome about it because a scientist if you type it into google images is a person in a white coat with a couple of pens maybe a clipboard <laughs> Uh, maybe, you know, staring really at, at something in a vial with huge goggles on. And, and that's, that's what we have in our brain, this stereotype. And that's what we need to break down. Well, I've been to Adam's lab and he wasn't wearing a white coat, but he did have big tanks. You had, you've got ants and things in your lab, Adam, haven't you normally? Yes. Um, yeah, I do have some tanks of ants and things, but yes, we don't all walk around in, in white coats. But but yeah, I mean, Rebecca's absolutely right. I've just I've just gone on to, to Google Images here just to see if it's if it's if it's updated from the last time I did exactly that. And you know what? Um, it had there's a few more female faces on there than there were three years ago. But apart from that, it all looks exactly the same, right? It's, it's all the stuff that everyone does in labs, which is with pets or with funny coloured liquids. And and I, I'm going all the way down to. Yep, all the way to the end of the page, and we got Einstein and some crazy hair. But you know, that's that's it. We still we still have those images. I suppose we could argue it's getting slowly better, but it's very slow and it's not much better. Um, well, staying with you, Adam. Science is part of our culture. Is definitely one of the things I said I wanted to get out of this discussion, and something you know I've done with my program over the last couple of years. Um, how do we get more people then engaged in the conversation and feeling like we are invited to the party? Yeah. Um, well, I think. I was thinking about this the other day. So 
my, my children go to school and if they want to learn a new sport, the school get involved in a new sport, they bring in a, a teacher from outside because they don't have the skills. They, they decided that they would, they would do um, you know, bench ball and they had a bench ball teacher. And then they have music lessons and they bring in a teacher from outside to play music. Um, but when I've spoken to teachers in school about teaching science, they'll often say, I'm not very confident about teaching science, you know, we do the bare minimum or whatever. And you think, well, why can't we bring in, if, if, if you know, science is quite a specialised thing, why can't we bring in science teachers, like we would bring in music teachers or sports teachers, or we would bring in art teachers, perhaps. Um, so I think that's one thing that we can sort of normalise, the idea that, that science is something that's not just a sort of add-on at the end of the school day. And you know, we still see that actually in primary school curricula now. Um, and I guess that that's one way to do it from there. But in terms of in terms of the wider picture, I, I don't think even now that there is this sense that everything around us is is the product of science and technology and innovation. We're talking over Zoom, you know, on a laptop. I'm drinking out of porcelain. I'm you know porcelain. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Illusions of grandeur. Right? <laughs> my, my soup mug that I got. Off, or, or, I don't think that's too any sign of porcelain. But but you know ceramics are really important. Where you know food technology. Everything that we that we do pretty much is is undercut at some point by science, and, I, and I'm not sure that that really gets through. And and certainly, you, you, you can see with with some people, I think that they don't. When when you sort of say, well, look, you know, your your laptop, that's science, you know, silicon chips and all that stuff. You, you can almost see the penny drop even in, in adults sometimes when it's like, oh yeah, you know, science really is all around us. And I think and I think that's something that we're we're not quite getting. We still sort of treat science as this kind of block out here, and people are into science and they're sort of in this block here, and you can't be into anything else. You know, I've, I've been reading a book before and people, oh, you read books. <laughs> yes, I read books. <laughs> I watch films, imagine. Um, there's, this kind of, there's this kind of idea that science is over here and, and you have to be in, in this little thing. And, and that's, it's, it's, it's everywhere, you know, and that, that I think we are, we're not doing very well. And then the answer how we can do it better is I don't know, um, but we do need to do it better. Um, we need to find other ways to do it. And I think, you know, having those cross-disciplinary things, looking at how art and science and things cross is, is a very important step. Um, but it needs to be even more pervasive than that. Uh, Joe, you said to me, science literacy, that's quite a key part of this, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I think it's, again, uh, uh, as Adam was saying, it's, it's the fact that it's not science and society, it's science in society, it's part of society, and just kind of a, a, an increased awareness of that really is, is, would be great, really, as, as Adam was saying, just kind of recognising the impact that science has had on absolutely everything that we have and, and what we do, the advances in technology, everything that is, has been sort of driven forward. And it's not, it's not an add-on, it's an intrinsic part, uh, an intrinsic part to the way we live. Um, there was a, there was an online conference this morning, I think called Science, Science and Society 20. And I, I saw on Twitter that there was a quote from Professor Dame Ottoline Leiser, who is the um, CEO of UK Research Innovation. And she said, if science was a sport, it would be polo. It should be football. So it's a bit, you know, I suppose not everybody likes football even, but it's, it's kind of a, a more of a sort of inclusivity that shouldn't be perceived as something that just a few people sort of over there do. It, it's something that in, infects, in, impinges on all of our lives and infects, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> And Rebecca, I think you summed up quite well by saying to me, it shouldn't be an us versus them kind of thing. No, we've, we've definitely got this mentality, this us versus them mentality, where like the other two have said, it, science is over here and it's in a vacuum and it's completely not. You see it every day, even if you don't acknowledge that it is actually science that you're looking at. I mean, you studied science in food technology and in your exam, you wrote about why this rises, why this bakes like this, why we use that temperature, why we mix this with this and why we add this first. And that could be, that, that counts as science as well, but they don't call it food science, they call it food technology. So somewhere in a person's mind, they split it and they say, well, that's in technology then, it's not in science. And obviously it's more immersive than that. And I think we do have to break down that mentality. And I think it starts with obviously effective science communication. <laughs> well, let's talk about arts and science then. Something you know I'm passionate about bringing the two together. And I don't know why they've been put in separate boxes. They cer certainly weren't in Leonardo da Vinci's time, were they? Um, Joe, let's 
talk about the Bad Bugs book club then. For anybody that hasn't come across it, I know it's been going for over 10 years now. Just remind us of how all of that started. Well, as I was saying, I, I was looking at um, how, well, in fact, I read Little Women, to be honest. I, I looked at Little Women in a slightly different way and saw how um, Scarlet Fever had impinged very much on Beth's life and actually the whole progression of the story. And uh, then I was thinking that there are lots of other novels in which there is some element of infectious disease. And then there's also lots of fiction where infectious disease is kind of um, central to the plot, although the story tends to be about humans. So I got together a group of scientists and non-scientists, I called out for people who were interested, who were interested obviously in reading fiction, um, to read books that we chose that had some infectious disease in, within the plot. And so, uh, not this year obviously, but in, in previous years we would get together in a pub usually and um, just talk about the book, you know, whether we like the book. So you could talk about the literary aspects of the book and then also about the scientific aspects of the book. Was the science accurate? Did you learn anything from the science? Could you transpose any of that science out, out of fiction into real life? Is it um, a fictional disease or is it real? Um, how does that particular, how does the epidemiology of a particular disease, has it changed since the book was written or since the time in which the book was set? So it, it allows us to have lots of discussion about microbiology and infectious disease using a book of fiction as the hook. So it's kind of what I was talking about, having a, a sort of platform where everybody has something to bring. And on my website for every book, I have a reading guide. So there's questions that people can use if they want to set up their own book club. And also I write up our, our meeting reports. And, and just for Adam's benefit, there are a couple of, you know, there's a book about zombie ants. You know, there's the girl with all the gifts is um, these sort of fungi, fungi that infect ants and um, take over their brains. And there's, there's a few, <laughs> there's in fact a few about those. So um, using zombies and vampires actually is a really nice way of engaging uh, with science because people are almost unaware that talking about zombies can be sort of skewed towards um, towards science but you know but it can so uh, over the 11 years we've we've read more than 60 books and, and I try and often sort of make a book club happen at the same time as a, a particular day in the microbiological calendar like international um, the le day of leprosy or tuberculosis or hand washing or whatever so I, I can hook other public engagements events in it but it, it's um I mean I've I've learned an awful lot from it actually I've learned a lot about uh, a lot about reading I've learned a lot about fiction and writing and different genres of writing and, and also about the conversations that you can have around that and and you learn a bit about sometimes misconceptions that people can have that they, they're happy to talk to you about in that kind of environment. So it's an informal environment. So obviously it's a small audience, but it seems like a very nice, um, well, it has been a really nice kind of environment. And um, since lockdown, we've been having meetings on Zoom. And that's actually been brilliant because we had we had a meeting last week and we had two people from California joined joined in with us, which of course we couldn't do before. And I've also done a couple of Twitter discussions on it too. So it, it's um it's carried on, but in a different way this year as well. And are there any books that you've read as part of the group that actually resonate with what we've been experiencing in the last six months? Yeah. So I mean, we, yeah, we have particularly, in fact. Through, through this time. I mean, we started off in March, we were reading some books about yellow fever. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing about that was that this disease, uh, nobody knew what caused it, nobody knew how it was transmitted. So that, and we did happen to read that sort of fairly early on. I mean, we knew how it was transmitted, but we didn't know much about the epidemiology at that time. Um, we read um, a non-fiction book by Laura Spinney called Pale Rider, which is a really fantastic narrative of the 1918 um, influenza pandemic. And we read a couple of books of fiction with that at the same time. And, and, and that was a great discussion because we could see, well, look for parallels between um, that pandemic and this one. Um, but particularly um, a book that we read uh, in July, which was called uh, Not Forgetting the Whale by John Ironmonger. And when I advertised on Twitter that we were, were talking about it, he tweeted and said, could he come and join in the, the meeting? And so he joined in sort of halfway. And 
the lovely thing about that book, which is about um, influenza, a new, a new type of influenza pandemic sort of sweeping across the world, it's about a little village in Cornwall, which is why I particularly liked it. But it was about how people helped one another and got together with one another and supported one another. And I, and I think, you know, when you, when you have books sometimes about a, on a monumental scale, it was just really nice to find like nice people and, and humanity and help and helpfulness in there. And I think every book that we've read, we have been able to pick something out from it, which is, which has helped us talk about the, the current situation. And, and obviously that's, that's been a fantastic bonus. Um, well, Rebecca, we've talked briefly about the Fame Lab and how you're the UK winner. Congratulations. You're going to represent the UK in the international final in November. Um, this is a science communication competition. It's been going for a few years now, hasn't it, where it's to talk about your particular topic. So what was it that made you go down the route of a poem? Sometimes I ask that myself, Jo. <laughs> um, I just thought that creativity and science really go hand in hand. And I started thinking about when did I best learn? And I learned best when my teachers were out of the box, when they were creative, when they were using something visual and something auditory and something where you got out of your chair and did something physically. I think the combination of all of that made their message much stronger. And I thought, well, I've got to apply something creatively to science. I don't know where we've got this idea that art and science are somehow polar opposites. We have a competition at the University of Swansea called Researchers Art. And some of that photography, like of stuff that's under a microscope is absolutely beautiful. So I'm not sure where this divide has started, but I wanted to put them together because I'm quite a creative person and I always approach something with creativity in mind. So it felt almost a little home from home to apply something creative to scientific knowledge. And it makes you think about what you're trying to say. It makes you think about the clarity of your message. It makes you construct a narrative and a story to tell someone over the course of three minutes. These are my, these are my poems here <laughs> that I'll be trying to learn over the next month or so. This is the first one for the semi-final and this is the one for the final. So I just feel that when you're performing something and when you can be emotive and when you can show your personality and be honest and open about what you want to tell people, people are more receptive to it and they'll remember it more. I still remember lessons where a, a teacher put on a video or just did something a bit different and that's always the one that I remember. So I thought I want to make people remember this and I want to help them remember the key information that I'm trying to put across. So it was a bit of a no-brainer to me to do it that way. Well, it was absolutely brilliant. I was completely blown away by it. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you for November. I'm sure we all are. Um, Adam, picking up on something Rebecca said there about art and things under the microscope, you gave me a good of something like that, didn't you? Yeah, um, well, I've, I've actually got my wallpaper up um, on my computer. There's a, a famous sketch by Robert Hooke, um, the physicist, actually, who did an awful lot of, of other work. Everyone, everyone was a polymath back in those days. And, uh, and it's of a flea, and it's just an absolutely beautiful drawing. And, and I've seen it in lots of places. I, I've got, you know, I've, I've been in people's houses where they've got it on a tea towel, you know, it's, and they're not, they're not biologists, but it's a cool image, right? And they, they've got it there. And there was, a, there was a fabulous exhibition. I think it's still on the way round now. A guy, a guy called Levin Bliss, who's an artist who's taken... Um, basically three-dimensional images. They're sort of focus stacked three-dimensional images of, of insects. And they're, they're huge, these beautiful posters. And you put 3D glasses on and, and they're just in front of you. And it's incredible. And, and we, we had them at, um, uh, there was the, the launch of National Insect Week, which we did at London Zoo a couple of years ago. And we had some of them up. And you could see people wandering in and they'd go, you know, what's all this about? And then they put, would put the glasses on and you, you, could, you could see that switch being, you know, suddenly they're like, oh, wow. Because actually, when you look at a lot of these things up close, they are stunningly beautiful. They just operate on a different scale. We're used to looking at lions and tigers and saying, oh, aren't they amazing? But we're not used to looking at things that are that big. But when you get into that world and, and you know, microscopy, is a, it's, it's a magical thing looking down a microscope. It, it, it always makes you smile when you do it because you're, you are entering another world. It's, it's just a, a magical thing. And I think if you can bring that forward in the form of art and you can get people to explore that, it's, it's really powerful. There, there was a great installation piece in the Wellcome Trust a few years ago 
which it's had a load of lights and strobe things and it was trying to introduce you into a cell and it had some sort of uh, bacteria floating around and viruses and things and it was it was really really good you know you, you could sit and pick holes in it and, and and everything but it worked you know you walk through it and it worked and there were just these beautiful photographs and everything and and it made people think and and that that is what art does and if it makes people think about science then that's even better right that's that's a great combination but but more importantly than that it just it makes you smile and you know that it, when people feel good they they feel receptive to learning new things you know it's 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 a win-win well, you know, no, I have anything to do with space and the images that we've had and we've got back from space just still absolutely blow me away. I think one of my favourites, though, is seeing a tardigrade blown up because they are very, very cute, aren't they? Everybody loves a tardigrade. And, <laughs> um, and they're, they're so easy to find when, once you get the technique right. I had a student who was looking at them last year, actually, in Pitfall Park in, in Cheltenham. And, and there is that magical thing. You, you can see, you know, looking down the microscope with a glum face. Ooh, and then suddenly it's... Because they're <laughs> amazing, amazing creatures, and you are you are entering another world, and and you know they're 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 predating on each other. They've got these sort of nematode worms coming out of nowhere and trying to side swipe them and stuff. And yeah, it's it's a it's a fabulous thing, but they're very very cute. Uh, apparently, they're called moss piglets. I've never heard of anyone actually calling them that, but that is a brilliantly cute name that, that apparently mm. they're known as. But water water bears is more common. But yeah, they're, they're, if you've not seen a tardigrade, Google it now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It'll bring you joy, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, moving on from the art sort of thing, Adam, how important is storytelling then? In, and maybe bring out the human elements, you know, we, we've already talked about how it shouldn't be an us versus them sort of thing and the, the human nature of, you know, scientists are real people. Like you said, I, I read books, I go, you know, I go to the movies or watch films or whatever. You know, how important is it to kind of have that, you know, the storytelling and also bringing out the human nature of science? I think it is really, it's really enough. I was having this conversation with someone this morning and, and the conclusion we came to was that it is really important and I think most of us know that it's really important but there's still a slight gap between understanding that's important and then incorporating that in what we do and I think that's something that we can tend to be a little bit of science communicators there is a you know you can sort of get stuck in a rut a little bit and you keep doing the sort of same thing and you get audiences in and people sort of clap at the end and talk to you and you think you come out feeling good and you think you've done good work and you have but you've not necessarily reached new people and I think that's where that narrative side of things can be really, really good because it gives people a different way of looking at stuff. And certainly with, with conservation stories, for example, and, and more complicated human wildlife interactions, which actually is the case with, with most human wildlife interactions in, in the world, they are more complicated. Um, those stories are very powerful. You know, I did that, that documentary for Radio 4 last, uh, well, during lockdown, wasn't it, a few months ago on, on animals that eat us. And when you hear the stories of people who have been stalked by tigers or have survived these attacks or, you know, have come across people who have been killed and eaten, their words are far more powerful than, than actually even a photograph of, of that event, which is, you know, very powerful. But, but, but it's not as powerful as hearing how someone feels. And that makes you, it transports you. It's like reading a good book, right? It transports you into that world and it, it allows you to think not just to think but to feel and then think different differently about something and i think that that is a big key if we can get that if we can get that in i think it's really important but it's it's finding ways to do it that i think can be quite a challenge because you know like we said earlier some of this stuff's really complicated and you know you need to and it's new language and all of those sorts of things so it's, it's hard to to weave that kind of narrative thread around them but but if we can we should definitely try i think um, Joe, you said to me, we, we did our event at Cheltenham Science Festival last year, you said, I just want people to know, you know, scientists, we're just human beings too, you know, and, and that was something, you know, people have said similar things to you, haven't they? And you yeah. also said that actually scientific papers, you know, you can almost think of that sometimes as telling a story. Yes, I do. And um, I always tell my PhD students, you know, that their thesis, <laughs> Rebecca, <laughs> is, is, a, is like a story because you, obviously you have to set the scene. Um, at the beginning, which is a sort of your introduction, then you have to have some sort of tension. Um, the, you know, what experiments are you going to do? Are they going to work? And then you have to have um, the action, you know, the experiments themselves, the climax, you know, the results, and then um, the resolution when everything sort of, uh, well, you have further work <laughs> is what tends to happen. But it's nevertheless, uh, you know, a story. And if somebody has to read a scientific paper or a thesis, they're still trying to follow the, you know, the logic of, of whatever you're, you're trying to tell people through your, your paper or your thesis. I think the, um, so it's got to have that kind of continuity. Obviously what scientific writing lacks is any kind of emotion. You know, we have to write it all in third person. We're not allowed to say anything was lovely or fun or exciting, you know, it's very, 
uh, has to be kind of very um, objective. Um, and I think that's sometimes when, you know, when, when you talk about being a scientist and you are being sort of human and subjective, then you can, you know, you can be more emotional and engaging. And I think um, storytelling sort of helps, helps with that. And that's about communicating in a way that people can engage with you. I mean, you know, before we could write, people would tell stories. So oral history and storytelling is how we how we've got memory and legend and myth and 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 everything so i, I think it's uh, i think it's essential to any kind of aspect of communication where you want somebody to kind of understand and be with you on the journey of whatever it is that you're telling them yeah and rebecca you you were telling me you know we are natural storytellers aren't we yes uh, we're, storytelling is integral to who we are as social beings in a, in, even in a conversation with someone, there's a set structure where you in, introduce yourself or greet them and then you go on to talk about how you are, what you've been up to, the content of the actual conversation itself, and then you always end. When an audience is watching a show, they have expectations that they will get a beginning, a middle and an end. And it's like the way we structure essays sometimes. We have a, a beginning, a middle and an end so that we follow this natural pattern that's somehow embedded in us. And I think when we've got such a complex scientific theory to discuss with someone, like Adam's saying, huge complex ideas, falling back on the structure of maybe something like a beginning, a middle of an end or something that we really understand and know could be very useful to put some of this information in a clearer context for someone and give them the usual patterns. If, if we start off by doing an introduction or putting out the key message then the audience knows ah we've started we've begun now we go to the middle bit the main section all the information and we will round it off at the end in a conclusion i think it's about using that natural instinct that natural structure of conversation to get our point across as joe mentioned though when it comes to a paper and you can't be emotional and you can't be personable because it's just writing on a sheet of paper rather than you explaining it to someone it, it gets a lot harder to get someone interested in it and to stick at it reading it well let's finish by doing some myth busting because this is something you know by now that i love to bust some myths um let me let's carry on with you rebecca because your whole amazing presentation for fame lab was about the myths associated with autism wasn't it and fake news Yes, autism has had quite a long history in which we've learnt new things, developed new theories, and some of those unfortunately get a bit stuck and they don't get busted so much for everybody. And then there's misconceptions and there's a lot of information and it can get quite complicated. Even in the way in which we talk about autism, it's gone from actually a, a symptom within a schizotypical condition to becoming its own condition to becoming Asperger's and autism then to just being you know ASD and then we don't like D because that means disorder so we switch to ASC even that is complex and changes over history so you can see how some people are still believe one thing or another it's not necessarily that they've taken the information it's incorrect it's just now historically it's it's old news and obviously talking about vaccines if we're at dr jenner's event then the mmr vaccine was a huge controversy where information was put out there that was fake news and we're still seeing the repercussions of that paper to this day even though it was completely removed and redacted and taken away from the lancet journal and dr andrew wakefield who is one of the authors on the paper is no longer a doctor because of some of the ethical problems that went with that research even though all this has happened this idea that the mmr vaccine causes autism is still rife within the community and it's used in the anti-vax rhetoric quite a lot. Um, yeah, Adam, I'll bring you in at this point because we've talked about vaccinations before, haven't we? We did a whole myth-busting special programme on um, 
reasons why people might have vaccine hesitancy. We, we definitely talked about uh, MMR and that completely uh, flawed, false, whatever we want to call it. You know, I mean, I still find it amazing that Andrew Wakefield still gets talked about. And we're, you know, this this message is still kind of getting out there. You know, does it surprise you as well that even tw- more than twenty years on, he's still being talked about? It, it does, and it's. It, it's a strange thing, isn't it, vaccine hesitancy? Because if you look back through the history of vaccinations, yes, there, there, there actually have been some issues with vaccines in the past. Um, uh, early smallpox vaccinations, there was the, the Qatar incident back in the 50s that I know we talked about where um, tens of thousands of people ended up um, getting the wrong the wrong vaccine, basically, and ending up with polio. So there, there have been a few incidents, but these are very long time ago. But I can equally, I can understand that people perhaps, you know, they, they feel hesitant about putting something in their body or the body of their children, particularly when there's this this sort of, um, you know, potential issue. And I can understand people in the 50s or the 60s thinking that because perhaps some of these incidents, the you know, cutter incident and so on would have been would have been more recent memory. But now that is that is not the case. But but what we see now, of course, is a different form of, of vaccination in a form. You know, we need to vaccinate people against fake news. But what we've got now is this is this ability to be able to gather information, but also to share information and to get the sense that the information you're sharing is correct, right? Because you get this confirmation bias in the echo chamber of whatever social media you're in, right? Where where you say something ridiculous, like, um, you know, the, I mean, we see this now, the, the government are trying to inject us with, with tracking compounds and things. It's nonsense. We're all carrying a tracking compound in our pocket, right? There's so much easier ways of doing it, right? But no, no one questions that. Well, they do question that, but, but you know, that's, that's not what people are concerned with. But you start putting, you can see people pushing these ideas out and they're getting people going, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. And, and so now I think we've, we've got the sort of natural sense that, well, hang on a minute, let's think about this, being reinforced with this, Sort of massive conspiracy kind of snowball that can develop and and we end up with with going from vaccine hesitancy yeah, which which you could argue is you know, natural sort of cynicism and skepticism about things it, it it pays to think things through right it goes from that into this complete anti-vax movement where it's all terrible and you know it's, it's all it's all killing us despite evidence to the contrary that it's causing diseases despite evidence to the contrary that the government are trying to control us you know the government can't control themselves. I mean, it's the nonsense idea that <laughs> most disorganized rabble imaginable, right? How they're getting involved in conspiracies. Um, you know, all of this sort of idea. But but I think I think the modern world, this sort of modern social media driven world where people are able to get confirmation of those ideas and let them sort of stew and fester in ways that were never really possible before, I think has, has led us in part to the situation now uh, as well. And it's, yeah, it's incredible that, you know, we're still talking about the, the MMR links to autism, which are not there, never, never were. And yet this, I mean, I, I imagine, Rebecca, you must, you must pretty much get this every day. I mean, I assume every day at some point or other, this probably rears its head in something that you read or something someone says to you. Yeah, yeah. it's still very much apparent. And I don't understand why, because right. if you read <laughs> anything uh, about vaccines which explains just how bad that initial paper was then you then you wouldn't believe why this has snowballed but it, it's something catchy and you know it, it's slick and it sticks in your mind it causes this that's yeah. very easy to share that's three words you could put that anywhere and once it's out there it's out there and it's in someone's mind and there's always going to be that hesitancy but once hesitancy moves to straight up denying it and then thinking even further then it becomes a a good level of conspiracy that i think is very interesting but also wildly dangerous well we're going to talk about flat end of this panel just because it's you know going to work conspiracies that's that's definitely an interesting one to, to to talk about um it was interesting when i was reading some of the things you sent me rebecca about just how small a number of the people that were actually involved in that whole Wakefield thing 12 people I think you said and it got me thinking to um, Adam when we've talked about how scientists do research and you know the peer review process and we've talked about retractions and we've talked about replication all of that sort of thing I mean I'm I'm not a scientist but to me and 12 seems like a ridiculously small number surely samples you know any sort of size you do in any kind of research has to be a bit bigger than that doesn't it? If I'm right, and Rebecca will know a lot more about this than me, but that original paper was actually submitted as some kind of letter, wasn't it? Or a sort of, um, it wasn't a full research article, I think, when it went in, wasn't it? It's to be, it was, I, yeah, more of, a, more of a suggestion that there could be perhaps a link here. It wasn't yeah. saying it has caused, but obviously could doesn't really sell papers. So. 
No. I mean, this links back to what we were talking about earlier, isn't it? About sort of statistics in the news and probability and the science has changed. You know, I, I, there was a politician recently going, you know, science has changed. What are they talking about? They, these scientists don't know anything. And it's like, yeah, science changes all the time. That's, that's, <laughs> that's how it works. Um, and I think that that sense of, you know, scientists never really, we never really know we're right. We just know how likely it is that we're wrong um, most of the time. And, and I think that, that that side of it doesn't really come across, you know. Partly because you know Rebecca's right, right? Could doesn't sell, and you know very guarded language about something all gets stripped away, and you're left with the the, the key words. Something causes something else. Mm -hmm. There was um, a, a cartoon in the 1700s when the, the the smallpox or the cowpox vaccine came out of people who were being vaccinated, and they were sort of turned. They had like bits of cow sprouting out of their bodies. <laughs> it was quite a famous cartoon that was at the time seeing a singer at this gender thing. So, uh, so even then, when there was the, the you know, the first vaccine, um, there, there was still this kind of, oh, it'll turn us into, we'll turn into cows if we have this vaccine. And yet, you know, here we are like 200, 200 years later plus, and, and that disease was declared eradicated. So that was a sort of global, global problem. So, you know, there are, I know it took over 200 years, but, you know, let's hope things, pick up a bit more quickly in, in the future, really. And I guess I sort of thought, because we're living in a world with a disease that we don't have a vaccine for, that actually vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaxxers, they sort of just disappear. But I clearly was being a bit naive there in my thinking, wasn't I? I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, this is the ideal platform. They've suddenly got a disease that's in everyone's mind, right? That, that almost gives them a focus, I guess. Whereas before, it's this general vaccinations but everyone's getting vaccinations all the time for everything and, and there was no there was no identifiable villain if you like but now of course we we, we have a, a focus for it so i guess yeah um it, it, it didn't surprise me too much to see them, them gaining momentum um but yeah unfortunately um also in some places that momentum seems to have almost spilled over into sort of quite violent protests actually which is quite remarkable really mm. Well, when we talk about conspiracy theories, Adam, you said, let's talk about flat earthers. Um, you know, that's an interesting conspiracy theory, isn't it? That we still sit here talked about. I, d I just think it's, it, it's such a brilliantly, like, obstinate thing. <laughs> so it's like a stubborn thing to believe in, isn't it? The earth is flat. You know, we, we know it isn't, right? We, we, there's evidence for it. There's a fabulous documentary on Netflix called Behind the Curve where it follows a load of flat earthers. And there's a guy in there who's actually, when you think about it, a brilliant scientist because he sets out to prove that the earth is flat. And he does so with a series of elegant experiments including sort of shining a light beam down a, a canal for 15 miles and looking at, at everything. And every conclusion, every sort of thing that he sh finds shows that the earth is, is in fact curved. But the brilliant thing is because he's chasing the hypothesis that the earth is flat, he doesn't accept the findings of his experiments, which clearly show that it's curved. He sort of thinks, I mean, there's one bit where he goes, hmm, interesting. Hey, yeah, how can we explain that? And, and, and he, he thinks there's something wrong with his experiment. So he goes back and, and, and adjusts it. And, and for me, that is actually an object lesson in why hypothesis driven science can be quite problematic. Um, because <laughs> because we, we want to prove something, we keep doing it until we find something that supports it. And we go, yay, my hypothesis is correct, despite the 25 other experiments I've done, which absolutely categorically show that I'm wrong. Um, you know, I think that that side of it's quite interesting, but it's just this, this sort of stubborn obstinacy to, to to, to accept what is clearly factual. I mean, some guy said he was going to launch a rocket to orbit the Earth to prove that it's flat. And you, you, you could spend a lifetime unpicking the ridiculousness of that, <laughs> of that sentence. But, but I think what I thought was that people didn't really believe this stuff. I thought they just sort of, you know, it was kind of a gang to be involved with, or they were just prodding fun, or it was, it was some subversive way of... No, that's not the case. Um, you know, these many of these flat earthers genuinely do believe that that the earth is is flat and that we will find out eventually that, that they're all right and that, that current thinking's wrong and you know i guess uh, you know science has been defined by heretics thinking differently right for sure you know galileo and so on but at some point you have to draw the line and say that maybe yeah maybe maybe mainstream science has got a point <laughs> but but flat earthers haven't reached that point yet <laughs> i find it fascinating that he's almost demonstrating the scientific method oh, absolutely, beautifully. Yeah. it's just not no, clearly not proving his point <laughs> and doing it brilliantly and showing brilliantly the great flaw in in, in it which is which is when you've got a pet hypothesis you will chase down the, the results to support it it's it's a trap that's easy to fall into but but yeah, it's, um, I mean, to, to be able to actually show that the earth is curved using the methods that he did shows that he's an extremely 
talented and, and great experimenter, just um, just not not so good perhaps at uh, results interpretation. <laughs> and Rebecca, assessment. Rebecca, you gave me some really good myths here that you wanted to to bust. Can you give us a few? Oh, I just. Yeah, I, I thought as soon as you said myth busting, I was like, OK, I will quickly go on Google and scan the first things I see. And one of them is that you only use 10 percent of your brain, which actually started off as a quote being you only use 10 percent of your potential. But somewhere that was changed to brain and I don't know where, but it got changed to your brain. And if you just if you have a moment and you sit down and you think about that. I, it doesn't make sense. Some part of you must be detecting something that's not quite right, uh, a not quite right meter, I'm going to put it, just in case children are watching. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an element of you that goes, that can't work out. Because if you get hit on the brain or if you get brain damage, oh, no one's ever turned around and said, don't worry, it's in the 90% that doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I don't think anyone ever thinks about that. I, I think they just go, oh, you only use 10%. Wow, I'm going to try and use more than 10. I, I guess people use it for inspiration. But when you look at the science behind it, it doesn't make any sense at all. But, you know, it, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and another one being lightning only strikes in the same place once and then it'll never strike the same place again. I mean, the Empire State Building is hit a hundred times a year. So, and obviously people have been hit. I believe there's a gentleman who's been hit four times by lightning. So he must be just staying in the first place he ever got hit by lightning now and saying, well, it's not going to hit me again. <laughs> <laughs> but simple things like that, if, if you question them just a little bit more, but I think in, we're in such a busy world and we're scrolling on our screen or someone tells you something and, and you take it at face value. You, and then if you do start to question it or ask someone where they got that information, what is your source? You might find that there's a lot of myths out there to be, to be busting. I can't remember how many more I told you, Joe, because I found quite a few. Um, oh, yes. Um, oh, I think... I Chewing gum is in your stomach for seven years. Mm. <laughs> don't swallow your gum. Don't do it. Don't, don't swallow your gum. Spit out your gum. Because if you swallow it, it'll stay in your stomach for seven years. I don't know how many of you have heard that one, but I definitely got told it. <laughs> and I thought that doesn't make much sense because surely, I mean, eventually, after seven years it'd be a bit of a problem and you'd definitely have a warning on it you probably wouldn't be allowed to eat it if it genuinely stayed for seven years in your digestive system but that's something that got just passed around just as a quick little comment and someone just says oh okay fair enough and you never really think about it until you go back and and wonder whether that is correct and look it up and see if it is <laughs> <laughs> well it's been such an interesting afternoon thank you all so much for being part of the panel um let's just conclude then i'm going to go to each of you and if we could should take away one thing in our science communication 101 maybe to you know communicate science better or maybe more engage with science uh, what should it be joe let me start with you <laughs> god um to communicate it just i think know your audience and uh be friendly and listen as well as uh speak Rebecca I think yeah be a person be honest about what you know and be honest about what you don't know if you can be friendly and put a message across then it, you're going to get much further than pretending that you know everything and eventually showing that you don't <laughs> and Adam um, I think try and seek out new places or, or different audiences try and find Try and find people that aren't being reached at the moment. And see if you can see if you can sort of uh, reach them, you know, uh, rather than sort of preaching to the choir. I think that would be um, that would be my advice at the moment. Well, I'm going to thank my panel then, Professor Adam Hart, Professor Joe Barron and Rebecca Ellis for your time today as part of uh, Science Communication 101. Uh, this has been part of Dr. Jenner's House Museum and Garden uh, Discovery Day online, the virtual Discovery Day. Everything's been virtual this year, hasn't it? So it's been my pleasure to be your host for this panel this afternoon. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Joe. Bye. Bye.